Cool. Good work. We're good. We're getting started. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Humans of Cloud Native panel, Find Your Way in Team Cloud Native. My name is Bart Farrell, and I'm very happy to be moderating this panel today. In terms of work, I am a freelancer, I'm a content creator, a CNCF ambassador, and my main project currently is Cube FM, which is a podcast for engineers by engineers from engineers, focusing on uh, technical challenges and trends in the Kubernetes ecosystem. That being said, I would like to introduce our panelists or have them introduce themselves. So first of all, we've got Whitney, but Whitney, before you introduce a little about your background, how you got into Cloud Native, I want to know one thing and one thing only. Pineapple on the pizza? Oh, heck yes. Good. Do you have any heck supporters yeah, in the crowd? Pineapple? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think it's, I had a pizza here in Chicago the other day that was really good and it had pineapple. Um, that being said though, Whitney, tell us about who you are, what you do, how you got into Cloud Native that in one is minute. a huge question. I'm 44, so it's going to be, this is the panel, right? Just me <laughs> telling the story. Okay. Um, I, my name's Whitney Lee. I'm a developer advocate at VMware. I um, host or co-host three different streaming shows. I speak at conferences. I've given two KubeCon keynotes, so I do pretty well for myself. But I also only just wrote my first line of code in 2019. I only learned what Kubernetes was at the end of 2019. And um, I spent most of my adult life as a professional wedding photographer. Not bad. Yeah. Not, I think that deserves That's a round of applause. <laughs> that being said, uh, two other things to add. It, well, you can give the mic to Mitch, but uh, one, I wanted to mention a couple of things. It's 2023, and I have still yet to write my first line of code, <laughs> which is one of the things we want to focus on this panel is all the different ways that folks can get involved. So next up, Mitch, take it away. Hey guys, uh, I'm Mitch Connors. I'm a senior principal engineer at Aviatrix, where I lead container networks and platform engineering. I've been on the Istio project now for about five years. I lead usability there. I sit on the TOC. And this year, I'm also serving as a uh, CNCF ambassador, which is pretty exciting. I'm happy to be here. Good. Welcome. Round of applause. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Miranda. Hi, everyone. So my name is Miranda Jaramillo. I'm a software, uh, full stack software engineer at the Trevor Project. And I'm also, uh, I created a pro an open source project for uh, monitoring Kubernetes monitoring tool uh, a couple of years ago with a beautiful team. And I also mentor uh, 200 girls in Mexico every month uh, that are trying to get into the tech field. Also deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Good stuff. So uh, real quick, if you want to take pictures of the names and pictures and all that stuff, do so now. I'm going to turn off the projector so we're not blinding our wonderful panelists. Um, that being said, this is an open conversation. I'm going to ask questions about our experiences in the cloud native ecosystem, the different ways that we can contribute more about our, our backgrounds as well too, and the different things that we're doing. As you heard from Whitney, she was a wedding photographer. I didn't know that until today, actually. <laughs> That's a fun fact. Um, but, but like I said, we're going to keep this as interactive as possible and, and, and also have time for questions. Sure. If we don't get to all the questions, we can continue the conversation in the hallway, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So turn off this. Woof, look at that. My first technical contribution of the day. Um, yeah, you can step into the light. Yeah. Cool. So I just want to contextualize this. Uh, like I said, I'm 38 years old, still never written a code in my life. I first started interacting with the CNCF three years ago uh, when I was uh, running the data on Kubernetes community. When I got started in that, the imposter syndrome was crushing. But I was very fortunate to meet two wonderful people, uh, one who's at this event, uh, Savitha, and another person named Rin Oliver, and they explained uh, the opportunity to get involved in the contributor experience group, uh, the SIG, particularly focusing on upstream marketing. I was terrified when I went to the first meeting, but I have never been more welcomed um, is, as I was at that, uh, at that meeting, and that's how I got started. Uh, since then, I've done literally hundreds of podcasts, talking to lots of people from the Kubernetes ecosystem, speaking at KubeCons, et cetera, et cetera. But all this starts with a fundamental principle, which will push away all the imposter syndrome. Every single person in this room, despite the fact that some of you don't like pineapple on the pizza, <laughs> all of you have value. I know that sounds like a really kindergarten teacher thing to say, but it's really true. All of us have value. All of us can contribute in many, many different ways. And these are the things that we're going to be talking about, all right? Mitch, I want to start out with you. Did, could you give us a little bit of background on what you studied and things that you did before you got into Cloud Native? Yeah, so uh, 
Super prepared for a cloud native career as I graduated in 2005 with an associate's degree in biblical studies. Uh, Round of applause. Imagine. Yeah. As you can imagine, I don't reach for that particularly often before the Istio meetings. Uh, so, no, I actually, most of my preparation I got on the job. I spent some time at State Farm Insurance doing data entry, but I'm exceedingly lazy, so I automated it. Uh, and then they gave my automation to 300 other people in the company and said, now how are you going to distribute patches? I said, what's a patch? Uh, so sort of uh, learned by doing and learned by failing and uh, didn't fail enough to get fired. So I, I guess we call that a success. Very, very good. And how did that bring you into the, uh, how did that, how, what were your first interactions with the CNCF? So I was working at F5 Networks, and I was evaluating technologies to rebuild our stack on top of. We were looking at next generation products, and I was fascinated by the combination of Kubernetes and Istio and the stability you could get in rolling out software with Canaries and be able to say, hey, I don't know if this thing's going to work. Push it out to production, send 10 requests to it. It didn't work. Roll it right back, and you've only had 10 requests at it. You don't have to worry about you know, the majority of your production traffic hitting that. And I was pushing and pushing for Istio adoption, and I hit some resistance. I happened to be interviewing at Google at the time. I did not know that Google was building the Istio project. I had no idea who was contributing to this thing. It was this amorphous open source concept that I didn't really understand. And it just so happened at Google, like, whoever interviews you has nothing to do with the role you're, or the particular company or team you're interviewing with. It's just Googlers from the office you're in just so happened that one of the Googlers was working on the Istio project, but you don't learn this until the, like, you know, at the 30 seconds at the end of a tech interview, they say, do you have any questions? It's too late to ask them, but do you have any? Yeah. So I, I asked what he did, and he said he's on Istio, and as he's walking out the door, I'm like, look, this is a little presumptuous, but, like, if I pass this thing, I want to work with you. Uh, and I thought for sure he was going to think that was weird and inappropriate and just sort of note that down in my file and I wouldn't hear back. <laughs> Uh, but, but he didn't, and I got hired onto the Istio team at Google a couple weeks later. It was great. Fantastic. Good. Miranda, what about you? What's your backstory? How did you get connected to the CNCF? Yeah, it's all good. Hi. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, everything started, well, I studied physics. That will be important in a couple of minutes, I guess. Um, in the academia and in, in my university, everything was, like, super uh, competitive everything. It was about, like, who's the best one. Um, and then that'll be important. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I started to um, get into the tech field, and then I was like, okay, I need to, to gain, like, actual practical experience. And with that, I, um, I went into a tech accelerator where we created a group of a lot of diverse and beautiful people. And then we started looking at open source projects around the world to see, like, how we can contribute to the open source world. And we stumbled to like, I mean, we saw a bunch of projects and we were like super confused. And I remember feeling like that fear, like um, what would happen if I contribute and someone tells me like, oh, I didn't need it bad. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, so what I did was, what we did is that we were really into uh, Kubernetes and trying to learn how to use Kubernetes monitoring tools, but then we found that it's actually kind of hard when someone is starting in the Kubernetes world to actually understand Kubernetes and to actually understand how to connect everything into your cluster, in your Kubernetes cluster into everything. So we said like, okay, there are these huge giants um, <clears throat> In, in the monitoring tool as Prometheus, for example, why don't we create uh, an open source project, uh, a new one, but for learning purposes. So that's what, why we uh, created Neptune, which is an open source monitoring tool, but it's like a very lightweight and very like simple, 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 because we wanted to give an experience to the users that are learning how to use Kubernetes and learning how to uh, also contribute to the open source world, because it can seem challenging to uh, get into a huge, um, I forgot the word, uh, do a huge uh, code repo or something. So it can be challenging. So we wanted to create like a, like a beginner's experience for Kubernetes. And that's practically how I started. And um, 
I started to do, one of my first contributions was actually talking to all of the people from other monitoring tools because we wanted to understand what their uh, goals were, what their um, challenges were, and how we can like reduce all of those problems to our end users. Very good. I think with that in mind, it's a reminder that never underestimate the value of a single action and that something that's going to talk to people, that's also a way of being involved. That it doesn't have to be straight shot to, I'm really getting into the weeds in a technical sense. In my experience in, um, in the Upstream Marketing Group, and shout out to Kasson Fields, Chris Short, uh, Kunal Kishwa, and a bunch of other people that helped me get onboarded there, was going out and talking to people. Uh, you know, we're gonna do a blog about someone. Can you please interview them and then share your notes? Like I said, there are just so many, there are as many ways to get involved as there are skills that people have, whether it's with language skills, whether it's with technical skills, non-technical skills. But Whitney, what about you? You were taking pictures at weddings, you show up in the CNCF. How did that happen? I just knocked on the door. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so I was a wedding photographer, and let me tell you something about it. For 10 years, I photographed probably 500 weddings personally, and I also had photographers who worked for me. I want to tell you something about it. It sucks. I hated it. <laughs> By the end of it, it's very circular, very repetitive, very emotional. There are a lot of assumptions people make about how a wedding should be, like based on their own uh, families and experiences. And so I wanted out, but I didn't know how to do it. This is, uh, and so my brother is a professional musician. He had an album that did really well and he needed to put together a live band to tour with. So for two reasons, nepotism, and I'm a very kind person who's easy to get along with, he invited me to be in the band and, uh, and go on tour with him. So this was it, that like I quit my job, I dissolved my business, I put everything into storage. Uh, my partner at the time, we'd been together eight years, they weren't supportive, so they were gone too. <laughs> And I, and I lived in a van for a year with my brother and some other musicians. What's this have to do with CNCF? Um, so. Storage. Was it, po storage. Was it Port Works or OPDBS? <laughs> I, I came back to the world after touring in the band. I worked at restaurants as a server because I really, really didn't go, want to go back to photography. My son was in college for computer science and he was like, mom, I think you'd really like coding. Like, mom, you would like this. And so I wrote, uh, so I, um, Basically looked into going to a boot camp and did all the pre-work for that. And I did. My son was right. I loved it. So I went to a full stack web development boot camp that has nothing again to do with cloud native computing. <laughs> I did at some point, we needed to get our stuff online and I was the one who put our, our, our uh, recipe app into a Docker container and uploaded it and figured out how to do that. And so um, from my boot camp, IBM was hiring, and they hired a lot of folks from our boot camp, but I'm in the room right now. And so they hired me, and I interviewed well. I learned Kubernetes so I could talk about Kubernetes in the interview with IBM. <laughs> and so as that part of that job, what I did was go around, we learned the IBM-specific products, and then we were meant to travel and go to different places and then uh, build out proof-of-concept stuff. But the pandemic happened, so the travel part never happened. So I ended up spending, learning my IBM specific products. I was working with cloud native tech, but I had no idea at that point that there was like a community behind it and like people who were gonna be my friends behind it. I was just like trying to make sure I earned the money that they were paying me, which felt like an exorbitant amount after being on tour. Um, so when I wasn't busy with cloud native, with uh, proof of concept stuff. I found my way into the IBM Cloud Lightboard Studio and they invited me, um, they put out a call for like SMEs, like who would like to come teach cloud concepts on the IBM Cloud YouTube channel. I'd been in cloud for like six months at this point. So like surely I'm not qualified for this, but I like there's a form. I don't have a lot of information. Maybe I just need to perform it. Like I have experience performing. I can do that if they give me a script. And so I signed up to learn more. And then they found me and they're like, yes, we want you to do it. And I'm just like, me? Me? And I was like, yeah, we want you to make a video. Are you free next week? Let's do this. And so I made my first IBM Cloud video. Um, it's called What is Etcd? And it re if you look it up, if you look up what is Etcd right now, it's probably going to be one of your first choices still. 
I, at that point, I'd been in, I'd known about Kubernetes for maybe eight months, definitely less than a year. And I did put together all the content from that video. And that video does really well because it comes from someone who knew nothing at the time when she first started researching it. So I ended up making seven, so that, making that what is that CD video is my, that's my first contribution to the open source community, although I still had no idea it was at the time. Great point there. And something that comes up a fair amount too is that a lack of knowledge is also a way of contributing because it, you it, know, getting those questions out in the open. A hundred percent. So I've made seven IBM Cloud YouTube videos and like, like there's one is what is Kafka and from this crazy beginner perspective, but that actually makes it so accept accessible to people. So um, from that, I was able to get a job. I didn't know what a developer advocate was, but once I got into VMware, that's when I started to actually understand the community and get to know the awesome people behind all the tech. If I can tack onto that, a, a lack of knowledge is not just a skill. It is, it's, it's a skill and that's wonderful. It is a skill that no one who's currently in the community has. It's true. Uh, I can never look at Istio with beginner's eyes again and see the glaring flaws for onboarding or the things that make absolutely no sense in the docs because yeah. I wrote those docs. They make intuitive sense to me. Uh, I probably recite some of them in my sleep. Uh, if you all are new to Istio or if you're new to any project in the CNCF, which you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of them, so we're all new to some project. You have a skill that no one who's working on that project currently has. What they need you to do is to show up and ask the dumb questions. I'd try to tell you that there aren't any dumb questions. You're not going to believe me, so we just won't have that <laughs> argument. Show up and ask that question that makes you nervous, that feels like it's going to out you as somebody who doesn't really know what you're talking about. You'll find out two things. One, you'll find out that seven other people in that room had the same question, and a few of them even maybe have expertise in the project and still don't quite get it. And two, you'll find out that you, by asking that question, are gonna make it easier for the person behind you to come and onboard to that. So leverage that skill, because it's something that you have that no one else can bring. I love that, and I think it says a lot too about the fact of being a global community with people from so many different parts of the world, and with different backgrounds on top of it academically as well as professionally, it means that different eyes are gonna see different things. And so it, it's what makes things more robust, more resilient, more resilient. Words that we're using a lot of times to talk about infrastructure, but it also applies to the richness of the community and the strength of the community. Now, something I wanna, you, you touched on, you know, beginners. Something we talk about a fair amount is, you know, documentation, good first issues, how, how to make it easier for folks to get involved. Also different open source projects having a contributor ladder so people can map out that journey. I say this because of interacting with and mentoring young folks who a lot of times just want to do everything all at once. And as much as I would love to see that happen, as much as I, I admire that passion, I really try to explain that before getting involved, it's best to slow down. It's not a race, it's not a rush. We are, we're not looking for people to come in for three weeks and then just get burned out and overwhelmed and think it's not for them it's really, really important to take this one step at a time. And so there are different ways to do that and different open source projects um, guide folks into that. Miranda, could you talk about how you're doing that in your open source project? Well, uh, there are like many ways to start and I would like to give some uh, advices for everyone because I know it can be challenging and of course you'll make that, that question that is what I'm doing like actually important. And one of those things, like the best important, the most important thing is actually find a mentor. How do you find a, find a mentor? Talk to everyone here in this room or outside. Like, I, I'm not kidding you. Like, go ahead and say like, hey, can you be my mentor? Like that way, go to the speakers, like talk to everybody. Everybody in here is so, so approachable. And that's where the physics thing comes into this, uh, into my argument. The physics connection begins. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because, um, in here, the community, the difference that I have is that, for example, in my, in, my, uh, in my physics field, I never felt completely comfortable asking questions. And in here, you can ask all of the dumb questions and all of the non-dumb questions. So go ahead, ask, and actually contribute that way. Um, that's the first thing. So find a mentor, ask questions, and I have my bullet points here because I don't remember a thing about myself. <laughs> The first one that I have is don't be afraid. Please don't be afraid. You know it's, um, 
it'll be like a curve of learning, like a learning curve. So be be aware of that. Everyone goes through that. We all been through that. Um, and you can start small. Like you don't have to do like huge coding uh, contribution as at first. Like for example, your first contribution was a video, and that was. I'm pretty sure that they'll be like super helpful for everyone. So you can start by even organizing, understanding the code. Everything can be super useful. So start small, um, have clear communication with your mentor or with whomever is like revolving the project. Um, look, well, okay, I said already that. Look for your mentor. Uh, practice empathy because we don't know the time that the other person has for you or for the project and also like the situations that the person is going through. So always have empathy um, and of course don't overdo it. Like sometimes a lot of folks get like super excited. I, I got super excited with my project and spent like hours of my time doing it. And I've heard that sometimes it's like a 20% of your time, 10% of your time, that's enough. Uh, don't overdo it because I know that a lot of uh, software engineers have this tendency of, um, of course, you you already have a job probably, and this is outside of your your working time, right? So where does your social life and your mental health time comes around? So that's really important. Please take care of yourselves. Don't don't, don't overdo it. Uh, everything uh, needs to be in balance. That's very very important. Um, what else? Slack. Uh, send a message in Slack. In the in the KubeCon, you'll find a lot of help. If you're like too afraid of uh, going to a person and just talk to them, you can send a, a message to Slack to a random person. I promise you, if that person doesn't have an answer for you, they'll they'll um, give you another contact or another thing. So yeah. Can I, yeah, the CNCF Slack workspace is a really kind place. And um, at VMware, I host a show where I need to have guests from projects come on and explain their project to me from scratch to a beginner, although I'm not that much of a beginner anymore. But we still start from a square one. And when I f and w the way I find guests from that episode is by going on CNCF Slack and saying, hey, can someone teach me about Istio? And put, just putting, just posting as whoever into their channel. And I've got nothing but kind responses. Like at this point, I've randomly uh, talked to over 100 people in the CNCF Slack. And without exception, everyone has been kind. Yes. So. Very, very good points. Yeah. The thing is, if, if don't, don't suffer in silence. You know, if you're not sure about something, either A, someone else has had the same question. B, if you ask one of us, for example, if I don't have the answer, I will find somebody who does. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or the resources that will be adequate. Take advantage of the fact that you're in, a, you're in a space where people really care about each other and they've all been there too. As you've heard from all of us, no one, when they were, you know, five years ago was thinking, I'm going to plan a direct route, you know, to Kubernetes and the CNCF to things like that. We've all kind of arrived here, and, you know, from different angles. Yes. And it's more than like, oh, they'll take pity on you. They'll help you. They're genuinely excited that someone is excited about their project. Like this is something they're passionate about and they want to share. So you're not even a burden by asking. Yeah. Completely agree. Also something that Miranda mentioned is to not overdo it. It sounds simple and it's easier said than done. Why is it important to say? Because lots of people are overdoing it. I'm someone that I would say also has overdone it at times. I remember it was, two, it was in 2021 at KubeCon in LA that Stephen Augustus said, stop signing up for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't take it to heart then, but I have taken it to heart much more uh, in the last six months of the year. And it's been very helpful is that, the, you know, get that balance. You need to go for walks. You need to eat healthy food. You need to have time to not be thinking about this kind of stuff. That'll make you more productive when you're actually working on it. Burnout is a thing. It happens to a lot of people. And what you may consider to be burnout may be much more drastic than what burnout really is. All right? So there, it, it takes many different forms. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. No one wants to see you suffer. When you do commit to something, always you know, under-promise, over-deliver. Try to be very clear about what the expectations are, whether it's with a mentor, whether it's contributing to an open source project, or being in the, um, the shadow program for the release team. Lots of different ways to get involved, but just Remember, no one's going to say, you need to commit, you know, 100 hours a week to this. No, 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 no. You need to be realistic with your other commitments so that these contributions can be sustainable. Other things in terms of do's and don'ts that you would mention, um, Mitch, what are some of the common mistakes that you see uh, for newcomers in the CNCF ecosystem? 
Let's see. Uh, the 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 blind pull request is is a common one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's someone who maybe hasn't attended our community meetings to hear what's going on in the project. Doesn't have necessarily a connection to one of the maintainers to be able to ask, hey, where can I get involved? But instead, just like pulls up the code base and says, hey, uh, like here's a here's a Datadog plugin for Istio. And we're going, well, we. We're not a telemetry system. Like we don't need a Datadog plugin. Datadog integrates in their own way with Istio. Like, thank you. Uh, it's interesting what you did, but we would encourage you to keep it in your own repo, and we're not, we're not going to bring it into ours um, because it's not something that the project necessarily needed. Uh, it's also not something that the project really wants to take ownership and maintenance of in case it's a drive-by commit. Here's mm -hmm. this one commit, and you'll never see me again. And now mm -hmm. I'm left keeping somebody else's code running and bug fixes and whatnot. So uh, if you want to get involved, start with talking. Start with showing up in Slack. Uh, almost every project has weekly community meetings. I know Istio, we do all of our meetings on Wednesdays. Join us. Uh, hear what we're working on and, and just say, hey, like, I just want to get some, I want to make a contribution. Where should I start? Um, docs are one area that I've almost never seen a drive-by commit or a commit that we didn't want. Uh, when we get docs committers, we like are, we, we have a small party uh, in the Istio community because we know, and every tech project I've talked to across the board, what are we all asking the CNCF for more funding for? Tech writers. <laughs> uh, so when we get a docs PR, that's one of the ways of making sure that it's going to stick uh, and that it's going to be valuable to the community because, again, who's, who else is reading our docs? People who are new to the project, people who haven't been here before, people who don't think the way that we do. So it's much better to get those from new contributors. Very good. Yeah, with the docs thing, was something I've seen and heard time and time again is the overwhelming amount of typographical errors that seem to make their way into documents. And so correcting those is helpful. Also with docs, when I mentioned something that's been the CNCF, I think for now two years, you know, the localization project through the Cloud Native Glossary. If you speak another language, that's another way to contribute, all right? I don't know how many languages have been translated into now, but I think over 12 or maybe even more. And then once again, these are the really cool things of celebrating the, the richness, the wealth and diversity of having a global community of people from so many different backgrounds. Um, that being said, Bart, yes, even more than writing multilingual docs, uh, reviewing multilingual docs. We get plenty of contrib contributions to the Istio docs in Chinese. However, the number of Istio contributors who speak both Chinese and English and can take our English docs, which are usually larger and are more or less the source of truth for the project, and make sure we're saying the same thing when we write our Chinese language docs, I think the number around the globe is two. Um, so if you happen to be multilingual, not just authoring, but helping review and say, like, here's what this person is writing in this doc, and here's how it matches with what's written in this other doc. So we're getting a consistent experience across those languages is super critical. I, I love that. And I think it also echoes what um, Miranda was saying earlier, is that you can't, you just can't underestimate the impact of, of these actions, you know, because someone who may have thought this is absolutely not for me, like, don't worry, it's in your language. Like, we're, 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 these, these steps are being taken. And I think, it's, I think it's extremely important. Miranda, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the Trevor Project is? If we're talking about, once again, um, be, thinking about folks from, from different backgrounds who perhaps don't feel as represented in other areas and what that means to them in places like the CNCF. Yeah, of course. So representation is super, super important uh, everywhere. You know, like it empowers people to feel represented and to feel like we belong. Um, sometimes, like, even if you see, like, in these tech conferences, you see, like, a, a, a huge difference between, like, uh, the gender uh, attending these conferences. And it's, it's something that matters. And I know, for example, that CNCF is doing a lot of efforts to try to have, like, these 50-50. And not only gender, but also another efforts. For example, I really recommend you, really recommend you to go to, give me one second, <laughs> <laughs> to check the CNCF Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group because they have like a great uh, initiative of creating a community of deaf and hard of hearing people here in the CNCF because it's so challenging to, to have a disability. Like my mother is hard of hearing and I can understand how hard it is to be seen, to be heard, um, not only by race, by religion, by... Um, gender or anything, but also for disabilities. So uh, I really recommend you to check that out because it's, it's, it's important. Um, and it's also important for us to give, um, to recognize that every, every one of, of, of us, ta, 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 that every one of us have um, a privilege 
and we also have a power. So we need to identify that power and to use that power to um, help others that have less power than us. Um, I, I cannot believe that we're giving this panel with these beautiful people. And in some other places of the world, there's war, no? Uh, so we really need to acknowledge all of our privileges and all of our um, yeah, power and to help others. So. I think that's a great point. It also goes back to what you were saying about empathy is the person who is across on Slack that maybe their name isn't, you know, you don't, you just don't know who they are. You don't know what they're going through. And so keeping that in mind when you're in these spaces, and if you have any doubts about that, of course, go back to the code of conduct. Um, like you said, using privilege and understanding what they are. And that also makes it easier to help you pay it forward and to know what it is you can give to others based on what you may have and that they might not. Um, so like I said, there's, there's great stuff there. Now, uh, going forward, all right, this is something because this is a conversation that could last 10 hours, right? But what are concrete steps? These are some things that we talked about with uh, the wonderful folks from the CNCF is that, you know, how can we make this easier? All right. What solutions do you think could be provided? We've spoken about perhaps having a Slack channel just for newcomers. There are some other things, you know, an, an onboarding kit. What do you think would be concrete steps that we could take, however small they are, right? Because we don't need to boil the ocean right away. Um, Whitney, what do you think we can do? I, one thing you touched on at the beginning that really resonated with me is imposter syndrome. So that was some, I worked in restaurants and in a band right before I started in cloud native and I felt big time, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be making this kind of money. Who let me in the door? And um, I went to like specific therapy around imposter syndrome. And I also read a book called Range that really, really made a difference and helped me understand that all my varied and wild life experiences leading to this moment, they're a strength and they help, um, they help me be more, round, more well-rounded, but to see things in a way that no one else will. So I, I think addressing imposter syndrome head on and maybe even having, a, in terms of concrete steps, like a book club or, or a, a support group or something would be helpful if that doesn't already exist. That's good. I uh, like actually, that. I have like a small tip for that that mm. helps me a lot. Just create a folder, like a Google Drive folder, and put in there all of your messages that someone has like written to you, like, oh. oh, thank you for doing this. Like all of the grateful messages that someone has sent you, or I don't know, like even recordings, anything that anyone has told you that you are uh, like the best version of yourself or whatever, yeah. uh, just put them in there. And sometimes when you feel that imposter syndrome, just read through all of those messages and all of those screenshots. That's great advice. And remember that you have value. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, Mitch. I'll give a two-part answer because I really liked what you said about that folder. Uh, as you mature in the community and as you go on and as, or as people help you to mature and, and mentor you, don't forget to say thank you um, mm -hmm. and to talk to them about who they are as a person, not just about what we're doing. It is so easy with video conferencing. It's the worst and best thing ever. Uh, you get into the meeting and you immediately say, okay, issue 1392 we were talking about earlier today. Mm -hmm. We don't ask, hey, how was your morning? Um, you know, how's your family doing? Or do you have, if there's a favorite pet that you have, what's going on with them these days? Uh, how are your hobbies going? Reserve that first 60 seconds for that and reserve the last 60 seconds for saying thank you so that that person too can have a folder uh, <laughs> to start filling up and to remember that they're appreciated. The other thing is uh, maintain a good first issue list. This is more of a technical thing, yeah. uh, but almost all CNCF projects have a label in GitHub called good first issue. And most projects have no issues labeled with that label. Uh, in Istio, we're working on it. And actually, if you come to the Istio contributor meeting tomorrow, uh, I don't know precisely when it is, but you can check your schedules. We have, I want to say, about 50 issues labeled good first issue, ready and queued up, along with Istio maintainers ready to help you get contributing on those. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start contributing, though, as soon as you've fixed a good first issue, you need to go and label as many first issues as you fix. Uh, <laughs> that's how we're going to keep from running out as a project, because it is something that we tend to, to slack off on. Good. That being said, we've got a short amount of time for questions. Does anybody dare to step to the mic? We can also bring the mic to you. Any questions? Yes. Hi, this is less of a question, more of a comment. Um, but 
so much of what you're talking about resonates really specifically with me because last year I was brand new to KubeCon and Bart, I don't know if you remember me, we spoke at the data on Kubernetes booth. I came up to you and I said, I do data, I wanna do it on Kubernetes and you said, you should go talk to the PipeKit booth. I went and talked to the PipeKit booth, we hit it off, now a year later, we're running all of our workloads in Kubernetes and I have like found my people in this community. Like, That's so wonderful. You put me in touch with <laughs> Melissa Logan at the Data Kubernetes Group. I got to talk at one of the DOK community days. Um, I got to t connect with the app delivery folks and I spoke to them yesterday. Like, it's so striking to me. Last year I was brand new, I didn't know anybody. And this year I have like real friends and like real connections in this community. And all it takes is, you know, going and introducing yourself and saying like, I'm interested in this, where do I start? You know, like that's that's what it was for me. So that's that's thank awesome. you, really Magical. sincerely. The, the beautiful thing is along that journey, you're gonna find that KubeCon is your twice a year family reunion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are our teams. We're working and interacting and over video conference all year long. And we're teams that are completely virtual. We never see each other except oh. for twice a year. So when we do, it's, there's a reason it's a big party. You just walk down the highway, high five, high five. Yeah. Like uh, all down the hall, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hi, thank you for giving this talk. Um, one question I had is this is such a global virtual community and obviously the last few years have made that even more so. I guess I'm curious maybe outside of the, you know, the meetings or the usual channels, how have you stayed connected to folks from the community, stayed learning from others, um, I guess outside of those regular meetings? I struggle with that. Uh, I struggle with that a lot. I'll find that if I'm getting a little bit frustrated in a pull request, like, oh, you're nitpicking my code, or I wrote it this awesome way, and you want me to change it this ugly way, I have to take a step back and go, oh, wow, the last time I had coffee with that person was 16 months ago. Yeah. Maybe the problem isn't actually the code <laughs> or the review, but the lack of coffee. We, we shouldn't be living without coffee. It's like yeah. a biological necessity. <laughs> uh, so, but, but actually achieving that can be quite difficult. It is difficult. Uh, and some sometimes I'll just put a I'll put a reminder, uh, or I'll like scan my LinkedIn messages occasionally, or Slack messages. See, like, oh, because I don't want to I don't want something to let some of it slip. You can even use something more like a CRM. It can be tough though. It can be tough. And also too is like the value of being here in person. I'm not going to deny it. I I really get a lot out of it about being able to see the people who I talk to a lot, who I interact with a lot. But everything changes when you're here in person. That mm -hmm. being said. Because of, I'm rocking my CNCF Bilbao shirt, because this is the local meetup that I run where I live in Spain, go to a local meetup. Or, mm -hmm. And if you can't go to a meetup, go to an online meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go to an online meeting and say, hi, I'm just here to listen. You can have your camera off, your mic off, and that's it. And no one is going to get angry. And you mm -hmm. can be there just as an observer, trying to figure things out and asking questions and, and t really taking your time so that you, no one is asking you to rush into these things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's not what this is about. That's bad for you. It's bad for the project. It's bad for everybody, all right? Um, good. Any other final thoughts before we wrap it up? Because I think we don't have too much time left. You must have something written down in your notes like a we good have, physicist. Uh, we have a oh, sorry, sorry, so you've got a question. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the talk. While you were speaking, I joined the CNCF uh, Slack. Wonderful. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, like, if there is a place where you can find mentoring there. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that maybe I can look for uh, a project that I like and maybe I want to contribute, but is there like a place in a channel or something? Where I can Do you know if there's a channel in CNCF Slack for mentoring? Or I, oh, I, will throw, I will throw the CNCF ambassador channel under the the bu I think the bus. Uh, but but it's locked. Under it's locked. Buses. But what you can do? Write me a message. Yeah. No, seriously, well, and I, I really mean it. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing as well too. Is any of us? We, yeah. yeah, we can we can talk, and then based on that, to say like I think you'd be better suited to be with this person. You can focus on that project. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there is the more formal pathway, which is the LFX mentorship program. Um, I we, you would talk to these wonderful humans over here for more info about that. Yeah. Um, but but like I said, there are many many different ways to get involved, and a lot of it, as as this gentleman was saying as well too, is just taking that first step and saying, "Hi, I'm interested in X, Y, or Z. Where where should I go?" And it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, please talk to any one of us. The and, Projects yeah. Pavilion at the Expo has all the open source projects have a little booth and those are great, great people to meet in terms of what you're interested in or, uh, yeah. To and get, to get a better idea and to see how well it's project. gonna fit. Yeah, mm -hmm. how well it's gonna fit with what you're trying to work on. Um, good, uh, I, think we're, I think we're getting close to our time. 
Um, but any final thoughts you want to share, Miranda? Uh, I would like to say that, for example, if you're struggling to find a project that uh, you, don't, you don't know if you want to contribute to that project or not, just think about what are your personal goals in your career and also if that aligns with what you want to build in that project because sometimes like it has to work the both ways mm -hmm. that's a great point and also this relates to something that came up in the keynotes in terms of value that people provide no matter where they are in this world or in another universe is uh has anyone read chris nova's book hacking capitalism Somebody should go and read it because it's really, really good. I never had the privilege of meeting Chris, but I'm really enjoying the book. And one of the things that she talks about though is, is what Miranda just mentioned is having an objective and your objective can change. That's fine too. Just yeah. because it's one thing today doesn't mean it can't change in six months. But I would like to learn this technology. I would like to start working on this kind of an open source project. I would like to become a technical writer and help out with the folks in Istio. Think about that first. Give yourself permission to have that change and that flexibility as well. But it makes things a lot easier, all right, in terms of what are the targeted steps that I should be taking to get me one, you know, one bit closer to, uh, to that objective. Mitch, anything we haven't mentioned so far that you'd like to mention? Well, I want to thank you for bringing us all together and for hosting mm -hmm. us today. Yeah. Her fault. And for the, yeah, Charlie's fault. Charlie yeah. in the front row here bringing us I all think, together. And, thank you. I think one of the things here, too, is that, which I didn't say in the beginning, you should never let someone with ADHD moderate a panel because they're always in a hurry and they want to interrupt people. It's the best uh, ones. I also want to say regarding that, if it weren't for the CNCF, I never would have gotten diagnosed for ADHD, so I'm really grateful for that. It's been one. And, and being able to interact with other folks, you could say that there are either more people that are neurodiverse in this ecosystem, or maybe people are just more open about it than they would be in other ecosystems. But that's been really, really helpful for me. What I didn't say in the beginning is the Humans of Cloud Native Initiative, which is fantastic, all right? Because it's kind of what Mitch was saying. The first part of your conversations and the last part of your conversation shouldn't be about technical stuff. And Humans of Cloud Native helps us get to know each other better as people. So then you see, oh, you like that sport, or you sing, or you like cooking, or you like... And then the, the bonds that might just be through a pull request get a lot stronger. So the more we get to ask questions and get to learn about other cultures, other people, their backgrounds, whether they were a physicist, uh, a wedding photographer, or got their, their degree in biblical studies, all these things, like I said, is what, what makes us the wonderful place it is. Um, Whitney. I want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Your time and your attention are both really valuable, and it means a lot to everyone here that you shared it with us today. So thank you for that. Thank you. Good. Um, one thing that we did say we are going to do, at least Whitney and I did, was that another way to contribute, we're going to create KubeCon history right here. Oh, no. What yeah, yeah that's right. Up for? I would invite you to sing. Oh, no. Uh, I tried. All right, I tried, everybody. Uh, if nobody else wants to sing. We will do 20 seconds of freeform interpretive dance. All right? <laughs> so we got our time people over here. You just want to clap. <laughs> oh, no. I dance. <laughs> You're invited to. <laughs> the, the audience has to do it, too. Yeah, like. yeah, we invite all audience members. I will shame you into dancing if you want to get This is here. about what it looks like when I okay, dance. Okay, that's okay. So this, is a, that's, this is my range. But I think it's important that we... That was more than 20 seconds. So we'll, be, we'll pass the hat around afterwards for tips. <laughs> But um, we we'll also get Kubaroki tonight if you want to check that out. But I think, like I said, it's the, why why do that? Because it's okay to feel silly. It's okay to this is an open space where you really don't need to feel ashamed. You shouldn't feel uncomfortable. If you're not sure about something, talk to one of us. Like what Mitch said as well too. There are ambassadors all over the world. So if you feel more comfortable speaking to someone in your own language rather than doing everything in English, that's totally fine as well. Um, so really just know that you have a home here. I consider myself to be really lucky to be a part of this. I never imagined something like this existed before getting involved. And I want everyone to be able to experience that as well. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we kind of covered it. Um, Thank you. We, yeah, we are in time. Last, last thing is that just so if you didn't get our names, there you can see everybody. Oh, yeah, no, you're blind again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> So if you want to take a picture, you can do so. But like I said, find us on Slack. Find us in the hallway track. We'll be around all week. And thank you. <laughs>